In 2019, the Parkland school shooting became one of the deadliest mass shootings in U.S. history. A 19-year-old former student shot and killed 17 people at the Marjorie Stillman Douglas High School. 17 more were injured. But what happened next changed the course of the gun debate, fueling a national movement. I talked to Dave Cullen, who chronicled the students who drove that change. He is the author of two best-selling books about school shootings in the United States. I met Dave Cullen at a studio in Brooklyn, New York. Cullen is the author of Parkland, Birth of a Movement, published in 2019. Previously, in 2009, Cullen wrote Columbine, the definitive book about the high school massacre that happened in Colorado on April 20th, 1999. The book spent eight weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list. The book covers two major storylines, the perpetrator's evolution leading up to the attack and the survivor's struggles with the aftermath over the next decade. David, uh, it's terrific to talk to you. Uh, I still remember vividly our, our first meeting. It was in Denver. I was making this documentary. You were kind enough to be interviewed for it, uh, even though at the time you had this enormous deadline pressure to like, I think you had to deliver like 100 pages on Columbine. Um, but I, the reason I want to start there is because people think that being an author is just like everybody, like I have like this great book inside me and I wanna, it's, it's tough, it's very solitary. So add all of that together and describe what it's like to be an author writing that book. Well, it's very iterative and takes me forever to sort of figure it out. Um, I ended up with about 1200 pages of Columbine and we published it about 350. So we threw more than two thirds of it away. My agent, at one time I was talking about my process, and she knows me better than anyone. She's been with me 24 years now. And she said, um, I can tell you your process. You hurl yourself into whatever situation, just immerse, you know, you know, within an inch of your life and just like live inside of it so like you understand what it's like and then you come up for air uh, with the idea of like, like, now I'm gonna tell you what it's like inside there. Um, and you're not sure how to do that and you just spit whatever you have, like a shotgun, like all over the page. Um, and then it's just like this big mess of like fascinating stuff. The Parkland shooting captured national attention. Teenage survivors turned their shock, outrage, and fear into action as they used national media attention to call for change. The teens demanded immediate government action and assailed adults for failing to protect them. Dave interviewed the leaders in the weeks after the shooting, culminating in his book. I saw you speak at an event in Indianapolis, and I thought uh, you said something that really kind of resonated. I still remember it, obviously. You said, I don't want to be this mass murder guy because the book had come out and made a huge splash. You don't want to be the mass murder guy because you don't want these mass murders. I mean, you oh, yeah. knew oh, how yeah. difficult it was to go and you just wanted it to end. But the other thing was you had more things to say. Um, is that a fair read? Yeah, I had two breakdowns. The first one, like a lot of people the first year, uh, but then scary because seven years out, which I, uh, didn't expect and that's really scary because like that kind of tells you that like like is this ever going to end like seven years um but meanwhile if i could digress one thing like uh the survivors kiki leba who's like an amazing guy he's the english teacher that principal d'angelos was interviewing when it started uh it was his first year and so like to renew his contract um I've gotten to know him really well to where I stay at his house sometimes when I go to Colorado. Um, and I, because of Parkland, so I guess it was, was that the 19th anniversary? Or, um, uh, the Parkland kids were, were going there, so I, I went there on the anniversary, um, and the week of the anniversary, um, and Kiki texted me while I was on the plane. When I landed, I have this text saying like, um, I'm gonna be a little late, Everything's fine, come on, like, uh, I crashed my car, but like, you know, it's gonna be okay. I'm not hurt, and I was like, um. And I, I said to her, it's like, like, it's like a metaphor in the driveway, right? I'm like, it was psyche, and he kinda doesn't even wanna let go with it. And I'm like, I'm I crazy, she's like, no, that's exactly what it is. Like, he doesn't, ever, he always takes care of things. Um, and so, God, one of the things I did not tell the Parkland kids at that time, was like, 
Yeah, 19 years later, you might still be crashing your car. But see, that's that's a really key point because people think this event ends, and it does. And you and you went back after Columbine and wrote about the experiences these people are going through and how they're trying to make a life, but how difficult it is. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, I'll give you another story. Um, this, you know, one of the things covering this long is like you you get a different kind of access. Um, this was something I never expected. Actually, that same trip, um, they like 60 kids came from Parkland. Not the most famous ones, but they came later. But um, like 60 kids, and it's only like maybe two months after uh, they had escaped their high school, and they were still messed up. And um, one of the things they did was they brought them inside um, the high school, and like about 10 of the Columbine survivors, but because there have been so many in Colorado, they brought people from like, what was it, the Batman uh, one, from several other ones, and one of the women from like the Naval Yard shooting had moved there, so like from a, a cross-section of different ones, and um, to talk to the kids and uh, for the kids to ask any questions. Um, but I saw exchanges, I never would have said, in the one that, uh, God, most heartbreaking one, um, this kid goes, um, He's like, you know, all these things coming up, especially prom and graduation. And um, we, we want to have fun and enjoy them. And like, are we allowed? Is that OK? Um, and then like, you know, he was crying. And he's like, and I feel like stupid even asking that question. But she's like, uh, and somebody was like, like, everybody has that question. And you know, and we had the same thing. Um, and the short answer is like, Yes, you're allowed to, and you know, um, and you should. And they talked to about like a, they call it the Grief Olympics, um, because um, people do start keeping score. And I got this from like everyone I've like. Uh, some people get really snitty about it, like um, the sort of levels of closeness, like like you know, you lived through it, but like you weren't in the room, like you didn't get shot at, or like you know, my daughter was there in the room. You know how close. Um, and people start like, you know, these like levels. Um, you gotta live it, your life. Yes, and it's bad enough if somebody can get to a point where like, you know, even for a moment they can enjoy themselves, for, like grab those moments, you know, hang on to the, like don't, you know. Um, but, um, but then they also, uh, I, can't, I always forget her name, uh, this amazing um, English teacher, a woman, um, and Kiki, they had both gone to Sandy Hook to help those, uh, people afterwards and the teachers and advise them on what to do. And um, they retold the story of, um, of you know, one of the teachers, Sandy Hook, saying, you know, it's like maybe a week out or something like that. I just want to know when I'm going to get my life back. And this amazing Columbine teacher uh, said, um, you never are. You're going to get a life back. The one you had is gone. It's never coming back. And the first step in your recovery is accepting that and grasping that. You can have a fine life. You can do all sorts of things. Like, it's not going to be the one you had. And you're never going to be the same person. You're going to be similar in a lot of it. Like, that woman who walked into this school that day is gone and replaced by this other person. And um, you still want to go back there. You, can, you know, you're an interesting, you know, in a way, you're a more rounded person. You're like, you know, um, you can eventually see the sort of like good thing, you know, experiences like, uh, but um, you got to let that go. And I was like, uh, and telling those seven year old Parkland kids that too, which is, but that's, um, that's the truth. Um, and that's all I want to know. There were 51 school shootings in 2022 that resulted in injuries or deaths, according to an Education Week analysis. In 2023, as of May, there have been 24 school shootings. You know, Dave, one of the things about these young people in Parkland that you convey is that they connected with so many people, like George Clooney, Ponies Up Money, all these people. And yet, one of the best parts of the book for me is you somehow end up with a Bruce Springsteen concert <laughs> ticket. And then you don't expect it, and it happens there. Tell the story. Yeah, um, yeah, I, it was sort of like a last minute thing. Uh, it, was, it was all about, you know, the past and his life, and there was like only one topical thing in it in like the last 10 or 15 minutes of the show as he's getting up to the present, and the show was 
totally climaxing. Um, he says, you know, it's something like, yeah, uh, and then there was this day this spring, um, the March for Our Lives Day, and uh, the change things for me, because, oh, he was leading up about like how depressing, depressed he was and struggling with depression and the world was looking bleak under Trump and so forth. Um, and then everything changed and, and I had hoped, and he described it so interesting as if he had been there, but by watching it on television, but you know, he'd feel the feeling of what it was like and how America was changing. It was just coming right through the air um, and gave like about like, I don't know, three or four minute spiel about them and you know, what they were as heroes. And then he talked about too that like, um, you know, everybody talks about the Martin Luther King quote, like um, what is it? The arc of history bends toward justice. And, um, but I don't know if he said, there's a corollary to that. Um, because like, uh, it doesn't just bend on its own. Like, it's true, but you have to bend it. And sometimes it's like really hard. And like, these kids are out there bending history. And I wrote that piece, by the way, um, as a sort of like, sort of like ongoing, as a very sort of like long sentence or couple sentences that just, you know, sort of like roll along. And like, as I was writing it, like, I knew I was channeling something. I was like the feel and the, uh, of something and I couldn't figure out what. Um, and I kind of didn't want to know because then it would, I'd become self-conscious of it and wreck it, but I was pretty sure I was like, uh, and I was sort of like using their cadences. Um, and a couple weeks or months later, I was like, uh, it's the end of On the Road. Uh, why? <laughs> Research suggests that the negative effects that mass shootings can have on mental health may extend beyond the survivors and community directly affected to a much broader population. This is according to a study funded by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You're going back there and, it, and it's painful. Yeah. Uh, you can see it on your, your face. Parkland, um, you knew diving in that you'd be this guy here. You were going to be absorbing more of that pain with these young people. Um, and initially, I think you were kind of like, OK, maybe I can do a little bit of this, but I'm not diving in. But well, you dove in. Well, but, but, but I went there with a different whole thing. And I told my, <laughs> my editor, who's like one of my best friends, this is my editor of Vanity Fair. And um, about two days out, he calls me and he goes like, I know you're not allowed to go back to the scene of the crime. but." Uh, but would you, consider, would you consider going back? And um, Parkland already felt like this magical thing of these kids rising up and doing something and doing something wonderful, right? Um, and powerful and taking back. Um, and I said, I will go to cover that. And that is like giving me hope and joy and filling me up with the positive stuff. So I'll go do that and I'm not touching that other stuff. And I get on the plane and it's just like this one line of this crazy vague thing. I'm like, uh, and so I sort of like fumbled my way there and then I get to this park where it is, um, which is the park nearby where all, you know, the mourners were. Um, and then like searching around, I had like, like 10 minutes to like find this thing that he described vaguely and asking people, where is it? I'm running around, I say, do you know where this is? Do you know where this is? And I stop for a minute, just like, I'm like, okay, just stop, take a look around, think, you know? And like, um, and so as I did that, I realized, uh, oh, that's like, it's a memorial, like that's a memorial. And each, each one they do something different. And this one, usually they're like a thing together. Um, they had that, but then they had like this also dispersed. I was like, I'm not at the memorial, I'm in the memorial. There's like one over here and one, I'm literally in the middle of the memorial. And um, that just like, I, and it sounds like my knees buckled and I just was, you know, down on the ground and like sobbing and like, like, just like, what the, f what the hell was I doing? Like, I can't do this. And by this point, like, like, like five or 10 minutes later, I was okay. I mean, I brushed it off and like, okay. And I get sort of like my bearings are like, that is incredibly sad, but you know, I'm not here to do this. I'm, these people did die. I'm like, I'm not gonna meet the kids who died. I'm not gonna meet their parents this time. I'm not gonna do any of that stuff. You know, I later did a little bit. Um, but, um, but I'm here, this, also this wonderful thing is happening. I'm gonna go see them. And I was able to brush it off. And I had a few more like that. Um, but, uh, but not in a terrible way. And, and also not like the first day where like, by then when I had like a few other ones, I already knew like, 
it's going to be okay. But they hadn't been on the path that you've yeah. been on. I mean, they, yeah, they'd seen true. the entire that's, arc. That's true. Uh, but what's the one message you'd like to get across about these mass shootings and the insanity of what's going on in the United States? Well, that there is hope and there's authentic hope. The kids gave me some hope. And the reason that a bill finally passed last summer and, um, and you know, people were describing the news like, oh, the first one in a generation or 30 years or something like that. The first one ever for the gun safety movement, for this newer approach. It was a start, it was one bill. But the reason it passed is because the dam has broken and the Republicans started to come over. Mitch McConnell has been the chief architect of the dam stopping gun safety legislation for the last generation. Mitch McConnell voted for it and got his caucus to vote. They needed 10 Republican votes to join the Democrats and everybody thought, that's impossible. They got 17 or 18. Because Mitch and his number two, John Cornyn, did a quick poll of Republicans in gun states, and which said that like overwhelmingly, and even, oh, I think it was among gun, gun owners, overwhelmingly wanted this and wanted more gun safety legislation. And Mitch, took those numbers to the conference and said, we are losing the suburbs. We're going to lose the suburbs unless we sort of change our whole game on this and urged them to do it. They know it has changed. Mitch McConnell figured out it's changed. Um, and so it's going to get somewhere. Um, not for a while, but it's going to get there. And they know it like Mitch McConnell has basically told us already it's going to happen. And if you don't, you know, who else are you? If he's telling us, it's going to happen. And we leave with that hopeful note. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for doing this.